The Arthur Khan, 28 years old and very likely the most eligible bachelor in the world. He's the Imam, the spiritual leader of the Ismaili sect of the Muslim religion, 12 million people scattered over 22 countries. His wealth is so enormous that to calculate it is impossible. And since a good deal of it is held by him in trust for the Ismaili communities, any such calculation is pointless. He's certainly very rich. He's a direct descendant of Mohammed, but his mother is English. He's a Harvard intellectual, an honors graduate. He's also an athlete and an Olympic skier. His father was Prince Ali Khan. It was his grandfather, the previous Aga Khan, who nominated him as his successor on his death in 1957. He tells his own story. The Imam, of course, is the spiritual leader of the community. The community is very mobile. They have always been mobile. Uh, generally, the figure that, that is given is between 12 and 5 million. Uh, the Muslims are divided into two main branches, the Shia Muslims and the Sunni Muslims. Uh, I suppose one could compare it to the division in the Christian churches between Protestant and Catholic. The main difference is that the Shia accept the members of the Prophet's family as the rightful successors to the Prophet in his religious heritage. They do not attach to them the status of prophethood, of course. This is against the basic principle in Islam. My family and myself trace our family line back to the Prophet and are accepted, therefore, by the community as the Imams. My grandfather was born in Karachi, lived most of his lifetime in India, and was the first member of the family, I think, to ever visit Europe. During the whole of his lifetime, he studied Western techniques as a means of improving the standards of living of his own community. And at the end of his lifetime, he had immense responsibilities. He had been president of the League of Nations, a means of improving the standards of living of his own community. And at the end of his lifetime, he had immense responsibilities. He had been president of the League of Nations. He had had a very active public life. My grandfather had not traveled a great deal and had sent my father, my uncle, my brother and myself out to tour the Ismaili communities on his behalf. I think that every member of the family was prepared for the responsibilities which might come to them. I don't think that any member of the family knew who was going to be the Aga Khan. But the feeling, of course, when my grandfather died was one of immense responsibility a deep consciousness that the whole of one's life as one had planned it had changed. I was no longer a student. I was 20 at the time, therefore a minor. But of course, the whole, my whole status changed. I left Harvard for a year and a half, toured all the main centers of the community, and then decided that it was the last chance I would have to complete my university studies. So I went back to Harvard and completed the year and a half in half a year. Of course, at the same time, was handling community matters, which was a lot to do. Harvard is a tremendous training, and I think it also teaches you to work under very heavy pressure if you want to get the best out of it. It is, a, I think, very unique to be able to listen to the greatest authorities on practically any subject which you can imagine there were some 350 courses being given at Harvard. I audited as many as I could. Of course, I didn't know that I was going to become a Khan, so that before my grandfather's death, I audit audited and followed the courses which interested me. Then after his death, 
I audited all those courses which I thought could help me in my work. And uh, I think was very lucky to be able to go there. When I left Harvard, I felt that to go through a day without getting out at all was the most awful prospect. So uh, I decided to take up a sport which I could do regularly. And I went back to skiing. I enjoyed skiing so much that I decided that I wanted to improve and uh, felt that the best way to, to reach good standard of skiing was to go in for competition. So I started racing. And I skied for the British team for, I think, two years and was up for the Olympic Games. I did not train, nor did I ski with the purpose of skiing in the Olympic Games. Nor did I ski with the purpose of skiing in the Olympic Games. I skied because I wanted to improve the standards of ski my own standards of skiing and because I enjoyed the sport. Khan normally lives in his house in Paris. He's got a racing stable a few miles away at Chanty and ten stud farms, six in France and four in Ireland. He owns, in fact, 242 horses. In this, he's following a family tradition. My grandfather's father had some horses in Persia and my grandfather had some horses in uh, India. But it was only, I think, when he came over to Europe for the first time and then, in fact, it wasn't even the first time, it was later on that he got interested in horse racing and decided to build up a stable. And he built up a stable which I think was really an extraordinary achievement. The decision for me to take over the racing establishment was uh, difficult. I have got a lot to do. To take over an establishment which had had immense success and which was as public as his horse racing was in itself a worry. Uh, I would have preferred not to take over the establishment at all than to take it over and see it dwindle and lose its vigor. So I hesitated. Added to that I had very, very little interest in horse racing. I was educated in Switzerland and America and hardly ever went to the to the races at all. However, having decided to take up racing, it seems characteristic of him that he's taken it up seriously. I really am very interested in horse racing now. I watch it with the greatest interest, and if I'm not in Paris or in England or wherever the races are taking place, I'm very upset if I'm not informed of what's going on. But the problem I had, and I still have, is that my time for horse racing is limited, and I have to fit it into a tight program of work. His home in Paris is the center of the headquarters for all the Ismaili Muslims. Since the communities range over South America, Africa, Europe, and the Far East, it's as logical for the center to be here as anywhere else. Which have weakened the position of the country for its future. Anyhow, I think you should always be there. The fact that we live uh, again in countries where the dominant faith is not the same as ours create everyday problems that have to be solved. And on most of these, the imam is, of course, a uh, consultant. That, I think, is, is absolutely excellent. But I think now that I have seen a number of points which he took with Pirati. Uh, in which he said that reorganization of trade wasn't this problem that... Today I would say that the Imam's duties cover secular problems uh, just as much as religious problems. The Imam, uh, and particularly my grandfather, and I have tried to keep up the tradition 
I have helped create schools all over the world, hospitals, insurance companies, banks, a complete fabric of institutions for the community to use and to better their standards of living. Since I have left Harvard, I've traveled every single year amongst the community. One journey or two journeys, three journeys, four journeys a year to the communities, depending on what the problems are and whether it is urgent that I should be there or not. But generally it would be visits to the schools or the hospitals or the sports centers or uh, the mosque in the morning, uh, appointments with leaders of the parties, planning, planning development of the community in the future. And I must say that if, it, if I am on to it, it's, it's just a series of appointments, discussions, visits. And it's very, very rough on, on everyone, including the members of the community who follow these tours, because in two months you cover an enormous amount of ground. And uh, there is a limit to it.